Okay, uh, good, thanks for coming back. So, okay, so now I'm going to um, talk about some more recent work, and um, it's, it's predicated on a new approach to the switching lemma. So I'm going to, uh, so here's a restatement of Hastad's switching lemma. Um, so it's, it's a bound on the canonical decision tree of a KDNF when you hit it with a random restriction. So what I'm going to be talking about now um, is a weaker switching lemma, but one which is more flexible, that we'll be able to generalize in some interesting directions. And the basic idea is something which is uh, a very simple. So <coughs> we're just going to sort of switch the order of operations here. So instead of looking at the canonical decision tree of a KDNF when you hit it with a restriction, um, what happens if we first build the canonical decision tree and then hit that with a restriction? Okay, so this makes a difference. Um, this is a much, uh, a much, much more slack thing to do, and, and, it, and sort of the analysis of this will give a much weaker bound. Um, so instead of this p k to the l, we're going to have an, uh, something which is like p two two to the k quantity to the l. Okay, so so there's a trade-off here, um, but um, we'll we'll see by the end why this is uh, this approach is more flexible. Okay, and even though this is weaker, it's still a strong enough switching lemma to show that uh, parity is not an AC zero. Okay, so we don't get exponential bounds for fixed D, but we do get super polynomial bounds. Um, so if you just apply this switching lemma uh, with kind of the best possible parameters, you would get a bound which is exponential in log n over D squared. Okay, um, so the point is it's, uh, this will give you something which is super polynomial up to depth square root log n. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a very bad trade-off, but it holds to reasonable depth. Okay? And, but what's uh, sort of nice about this is that the argument I'm going to show uh, has a very neat generalization to affine restrictions. So I'll talk about this later, but the idea so far, the, by restriction, I've been referring to subcube of the, of the Hamming cube. But we're, we're uh, going to be looking later on at restrictions to um, more general affine subsets of the Hamming cube. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain what that is uh, later. Okay, so here's the uh, outline for the second part of the, of the talk. Um, so I'm going to be, we're going to revisit this decision tree switching lemma. And I'm going to show you a proof of that decision tree switching lemma, and I'll go through it very slowly. And uh, you know, w once we understand that, each of the there's going to be a series of of small steps uh, generalizing that the argument, and hopefully it should be easy to follow. Um, okay, and we're going to build to some very general switching lemma for an arbitrary distribution of affine uh, restrictions. Okay, and then I'll say something at the end about how we actually use this uh, switching lemma uh, to get a lower bound in the proof complexity setting for this uh, Cyton tautologies on expander graphs. So this is the outline. So let's start with this decision tree switching lemma. Okay, and so before, just a bit of notation before, before we get started. Um, so just a binomial random variable. So it, if we have a finite set n, think of it as a set of variable indices. So by this, this notation here, so bold, bold face s subset p of n, I just mean a p-biased random subset of n. So um, in, uh, independently for each element of i, I include it in s with probability p, independently. Okay? And the binomial distribution is just uh, uh, basically sample of p biased subset of 1 to n and take its size. Okay, this is the... Okay, so that's uh, just a bit of notation. So here's the decision tree switching lemma. We saw this already at the, in the first half of the talk. Um, and the bound was similar to the Hostad switching lemma, but the proof is much simpler. Um, well, there are actually different ways to prove it, but uh, I'll show you a particular proof. Okay, so the statement is uh, we have T, which is a depth K decision tree. 
and we said the probability that when we hit T with the with the RP that the depth is bigger than L is at most 2 pK to the L. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you a, a particular proof of this. And in fact, I, I should mention that you can actually show something stronger. You get 2 pK over L to the L, but let's just look at this. So, all right, now I'll go, I'll, let's try to make sure everyone understands this proof because we'll, we're going to make a series of small generalizations, but if you can understand this, then I think the rest should be uh, fairly straightforward. So we're going to consider a random walk down the decision tree T. Okay, sort of, we're going to start at, the, start at the root and go to one of the two children with equal probability. Okay, so if we, in, in this case, you know, the probability of ending up here would be one-fourth, one-eighth, one-sixteenth on this level and so on. Okay, so this is equivalent to evaluating T at a uniform random element of the hypercube and see where you end up. Okay, so this is whenever I say a random branch or a random walk down T, this is the, the distribution I'm referring to. So note that this is different than uniform random distribution on branches. Um, okay, well, just, just to illustrate <laughs> this, okay, so you, we, we walk down and here we end up here, so. Okay, and I'm going to denote by this bold face beta of T will be a random variable associated with T. It's going to be the set of variables that's queried on a random branch of T. Okay, so it's a random variable associated with, with T. So for example, okay, and, and yeah, this, uh, n n this is the cardinality of, of, of this set is the number of variables that's queried on a random branch of T. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so here's a fairly trivial observation. If the depth, if our decision tree has depth at least k, then the probability that we read k variables on a random branch is, is at least 2 to the minus k. Okay, and this is, this is, a, this is easy to see here because, you know, each, each, each uh, branch of depth k has probability 2 to the minus k. Okay, so it's a very basic observation. Okay, now uh, here's a, a, a claim. So we're, we're going to look at two different ways of generating the same distribution. Okay? Um, so first, we're going to hit T with, a, with RP and then take a random walk down, down that decision tree. That's the, that's the first distribution. So look at the set of variables that are queried on a random branch of T uh, restricted on the RP. And the second random variable, will, first we take a random walk down T. They look at the variables that you read and then take a P biased subset of that. Okay, and I claim these are the same. And, okay, and, and by taking cardinalities, uh, so the cardinality here is this is just the binomial distribution on the number of variables read in the random branch. Okay. So let me try to even just illustrate this. So here, here's, a, here's some decision tree. Yeah? Can you say what you mean by p-biased subset? Oh, good. So uh, for, each, for each of the elements here, include it in the set S independently with probability p. Okay, so here's, here's some decision tree. Um, Let's look at kind of this first, let's, let's look at this first distribution. So <clears throat> first let's look at the stars of RP, all right, and, and you know, they look somehow, okay, and you know, you, you can have the same variable appearing um, multiple places in the tree, so these, these aren't kind of independent, but they will be independent along a branch, that's, that's the key point. So we assume without loss of generality that the decision tree never queries the same variable twice on a branch. So now, here's to try to illustrate what does RP look like in this decision tree. Well, for everything which is not a star, it's getting set to a zero or a one. So we're kind of selecting a random child uh, of, of, of each of the um, non-starred variables. And once again, these aren't independent necessarily. You, know, you could have the same variable appearing in two places, but along any branch, it's going to be independent. That's the key. The key uh, property we need. So now re recall what it means um, to hit a decision tree with a restriction. 
What it means is you, well, whenever you, a variable gets set by the restriction, then you just kind of, you can trim away the entire subtree that's not followed. Um, so it, it, it kind of looks like this. We can cut out all of these things, and then we can simplify. So the under, so we're right, just removing all that stuff, and then the underlying decision tree looks like this, right? We, we th this re this becomes the root here. Um, right, so the, we have these blue nodes, which are the which are the kind of living ones that are in like this. Now we're going to take a random walk down this decision tree. So we start here, and we flip a coin, and okay, we go down here, and we can eliminate that. So what is this? This random variable here is going to this uh, the set of variables we read in in this random walk down this decision tree would be these two variables here. Okay, so just to illustrate what this what this is doing, and the claim is this is the same as as uh, this distribution here. It's the same as though we had first taken a random walk down the tree, and then we just sample. Okay, and just focus on that branch, and now we just take a p biased random subset there. So independently, we I'll flip a coin for each guy. Okay, so hopefully this is this is uh, pretty clear. Okay, and then just by taking cardinalities, we can say that the number of variables read in a, in, a, in a random walk in T restricted on RP is the same as you take a random branch in, in, in T, the set of variables queried on a random branch and take a, a P by a subset, uh, or sorry, the size of a P by a subset. Okay, so now let's, let's now give a proof of this decision tree switching lemma using this, this simple equivalence of these two distributions. Okay, so, all right, this is the thing we're trying to bound, the probability that the depth of T on RP is bigger than L. So now, let's recall that the, the observation we made earlier, that for any decision tree T prime, if its depth is bigger than L, then, the prob the, then with probability at least 2 to the minus L, some branch reads at least L variables. Okay, so I'm just going to plug that, I'm just going to plug that in here. Okay, and, and to be clear, so now, there are two different random variables at play, uh, depending on each other. So I, I index. So this is a probability over RP alone, and then we have a probability over the random walk in T restricted on RP, um, and we have this. So now I'm going to use. Okay, I'm going to just use Markov's inequality. Okay, that I mean the probability that some random variable is bigger than two to the minus L is at most 2 to the L times the expectation of that random variable. Okay? And now we can just simplify this. I mean, we just have an, an expectation of a probability, so this is just a probability. Okay, so let's just rewrite it like this. All right, so it's at most 2 to the L times the probability that you read at least L variables on a random branch of T restricted on RP. Okay, and now we use this equivalence of these two distributions. Okay, so we already noted that this random variable is the same as first you take a, take a, num a random branch in T and then take a binomial random variable for the, l for the length of that, uh, of that branch. Now finally we use the fact that you know, K is a depth K decision tree. So the, the number of uh, variables I mean, that you could read on a branch is at most k, so we can just, uh, uh, we can just bound this by k here. All right, and then finally we're going to take a, just a simple union bound. It's a very crude way to bound a binomial random variable, so the probability that the binomial, you know, kp is at, is at least l, well there has to be some l element subset of k, which is, which is uh, within the set. Um, so basically, there, we can say they're at most k to the l events, and they each happen with probability p to the l. So this is the uh, last step, right? And this is, uh, yeah, this is the, the entire proof. So did everyone follow that, more or less? Is that, okay. So what I'm going to show next is just that this argument generalizes in a, in a few different ways. Um, so, okay, next uh, I'm going to extend this argument from depth k decision trees to 
uh, what I'll call k-clipped decision trees. I'll, I'll define that next. Yeah? Sorry, I missed. Where, where did you use that the, um, the stars are independent along a branch? Um, it's used in, in the claim that, that these two guys are equivalent. Okay, so it's used in the claim that those two are equivalent and nowhere else in this, in this argument? Um, yeah, I think that's... Yeah. Okay, so okay, so let's recall this. This is a slide from the first half of the talk. The canonical decision tree of a KDNF. Okay, this was this was uh, how we how we defined it. Now I want to make an observation about the about this definition. So we have some decision tree, and I mean a KDNF can have arbitrarily many clauses. So the I mean, the bra the the depth of this decision tree can be arbitrarily large. Uh, so we can't apply the previous switching lemma directly, but we can observe the following. That I claim that every node in this decision tree has distance at most k from some leaf. Okay? Um, and you can see that just the way this is constructed. I mean, it, the, so this is a 3 DNF here. This, this clause has length 3, so we started out by you, you had this, this subtree here, and it ended in a 1, and then we can can you continue the construction here. But, you know, each part of this decision tree comes from some clause, and below it there's some way to get to a 1. Okay? So, this, is, this uh, motivates this definition of a k-clipped decision tree. So we say that a decision tree is k-clipped if every node in the decision tree has distance at most k from some leaf. Okay? So it could be unbounded depth, but you have this, this property. Okay, and what we just observed is that if f is a k DNF or k CNF, then the canonical decision tree of f is k clipped. Okay? <coughs> now, the other thing we'll need, which I'm, I'm not going to give the proof of, but uh, it's not hard to work out, we need a kind of bound on the moments of the, this, the length of a random walk in a k clipped decision tree. Okay, so the, the, the lemma is that if we, look at the, if we look at the expectation of the number of variables you read on a random branch in a k-clip decision tree, choose L, okay, this is uh, order of k times 2 to the k quantity to the L. Okay, so this is, the, this is just a moment bound. The way that you prove this is you can you can note that in a k-clip decision tree, if you look at the length of a random branch in that tree, so that random variable is stochastically dominated by another random variable, which is maybe easier to think about, just the number of unbiased coin flips. You make a sequence of unbiased coin flips and um, you know, stop once you see k consecutive heads. Okay, and um, if you, in some sense, if, you, if your k-clip decision tree is the kind of maximal k-clip decision, you know, every node has, you know, uh, well, if you, if you well, I, I guess this would be kind of inequality for certain k-clip decision tree, but, okay, this is uh, What is stochastically dominated? Um, so it means basically that, uh, um, The leading term of the probability. Yeah, it means that if you have a bound on, on uh, let's see, like a tail bound on one variable is, implies a tail bound on the other variable. Okay, so now here's the, here's the first generalization of our decision tree switching lemma that I, I want to present, and it's going to be exactly the same argument that I showed before. Okay, so this is a k-clip decision tree switching lemma. So now t is not a depth k decision tree, but t is a k-clip decision tree, and we get um, a switching lemma where the bound is now pk 2k to the L instead of pk to the L. All right, and I, I want to claim the proof is really exactly the same. Um, so the first part of the proof, this is exactly, I'm just repeating the argument. And th I mean, this equivalence of these distributions had nothing to do with, this was for any decision tree T whatsoever. Um, so this holds. And now here, so previously we said that well, we can, we can just put in a k there because we had a depth k decision tree. Now we have to use our, our lemma, our, 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 um, our moment bound 
Um, so when you take a union bound over here now, we, we get, well, an expectation of the length of a random walk in, in T, choose L times P to the L. Um, and now we just, now we use our, our lemma, which is bounding that quantity by order uh, K to K to the L. All right, so when you put these things together, you get uh, uh, the, 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 the factors of this bound. So do you know if that's tight? Uh, I believe it's tight. I believe it's tight, yeah. Now note that, I, I mean, a cor I, I don't know if I stated, okay, I mean a corollary is that if we have a KDNF, then we get the same bound because we noted that the canonical decision tree of a KDNF, so for, for KDNF it's not tight. So in other words, for a K-clip decision tree which comes, which comes from a KDNF, it's not tight. Oh, it could also be tight for KDNF in the sense that if you use a canonical decision tree and hit it with our restriction, this could still be the best probability we get. And I think that might be the case actually. Uh, I mean, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about it, but I, but an, but I. Okay, I'll th I'm not sure about it, but certainly I think for arbitrary click K clip decision tree, I think you can't do better if you had each variable is only appearing once. So, um, but well, if you're well, doing so this way of constructing decision trees where for KDNF, where you're taking the canonical decision tree and then hitting it with random description. Um, I think it's a case that you can't beat this kind of problem. Yeah, I, I believe you can't, yeah. I believe, yeah. So, and note that the, the you know, importantly, the switching lemma, Hastad switching lemma is doing something different, right? It's, you first hit your, your DNF with a random restriction, then build a canonical decision tree. So this is a much cruder thing to do. Okay. But let me show that this has a, a the first kind of application of this, this, uh, you know, weaker argument, but, you know, showing that it's more flexible, Let's now expand our, like, the, the class of random restrictions that we'll be looking at. Okay, so, um, now, I'll, previously this kind of bold face S was always a p-biased p subset of N, but now I want to consider an arbitrary distribution of stars. So, let this bold face S here is a, just any random variable ranging over subsets of, uh, of our variables. Okay, and we think of it as being the stars of a random restriction. Now, and actually throughout the rest of the talk, I mean, boldface U will be a uniform random element in the hypercube. And now, so given S and U, and these are independent. And given S and U, we can define a random restriction. Okay, so it's completely determined by any particular S and U. So this is denoted rho sub S U, and for you know, each variable i, if i is an s, it's a star, and otherwise we set it according to u sub i. Okay? So this is a, uh, so for every distribution of stars, we get a random restriction in this way. So it's unbiased with respect to zeros and ones, once you condition on the stars. And uh, this is really a generalization of, R of this RP distribution that we have been considering so far. That would simply be the case where S is a p-biased subset of the variables. Then this would be giving exactly the, the uh, RP. Okay? All right. Uh, yep. Okay, so uh, in order to be able to say something about, about uh, arbitrary distribution of stars, we, well, we need to be able to quantify somehow, uh, say something about it. So, um, in particular, when is, it, when is it sufficiently like a uh, p-biased subset of 1 to n for our switching lemma argument to apply? So I'm going to introduce this notion of, of s being p-bounded. Okay, so let p be a, some parameter in 0, 1. I'll say that your s is p-bounded if for every subset of variables j, the probability that j is contained in s is at most p to the size of j. Okay, and note that this is something which is certainly true for the, for the, um, uh, for the p-biased subset of n. Okay? Now the claim, uh, now I claim that we have the same equivalence of distributions, and this is, this is going to be true for an arbitrary s, in fact. So, um, 
th basically restating what we, what we had before. Um, so if you first were to hit T with this random restriction rho SU, and then take a random walk down there, this is the same thing as take, look at the variables of a random, uh, a random walk in T, and then intersect that with S. Okay? So this is really the exact same argument that, that we saw before. It's using independence of the, of the S and the, and the U. And, and moreover, I mean, it's, it, really the way to see this is, it's, it's, this is in fact true for any fixed S. So, so it's certainly true for a random S. S is some subset of variables that you chose. Um, it's P bias in the sense that you, uh, the distribution is P. It's so so. This boldface S is a it's a random it's a random variable ranging over subsets of one to n, and we say that it's P bounded. If if it if it's so P bounded is a kind of monotone property. So it's not it's not exactly. A, so when I said previously p biased random subset, I meant that that it was, you know, independent for each for each coordinate. And here I, I don't, you know, a, a key point here is that s can have, um, you know, the whether or not variables i and j are in s, those can be dependent in arbitrary ways, so long as you know, for, for we have this p bounded property. Okay, so so we have this equivalence here. Okay, and now a consequence is that if S is P bounded, then by taking a union bound, we, 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 uh, we can say this. Okay, so the, the probability that if you take a random, take a random branch, the set of variables in a random branch, you intersect it with S, the probability that that is bigger than L, we can take a union bound over all L element subsets of the, of the, uh, of the random branch. And for each of those, we know that the probability is that, that S contains those particular variables is at most P to the L. So we can, this is just a union bound. Does that equivalence on the coordinate, like, does it rely on the randomness in U, or is it true of fixed U? Uh, oh yeah, most definitely relies on the randomness in U. Uh, yeah. We're still talking about k clip, right? Um, no, th so this is actually for any decision tree, T whatsoever. In fact, from now on, I mean, I'm only going to be considering k clip decision trees, but yeah, this holds, this here holds for any T and any S, in fact. So this is a very general observation. Okay. So now here's the, here's the, the third of our, of our uh, switching lemmas, which is, again, a direct generalization. So now we can state a switching lemma for k clip decision trees with respect to any p-bounded distribution of stars, okay? And it's, this is exactly the same bound that we had before, and it's exactly the same proof that we had before. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully this, is, uh, this is pretty clear. All right, and I'm running probably ahead of time. I'll probably finish a bit early. But let me, uh, okay, let me give the final uh, generalization now. Okay, so, um, so, so far I've been speaking of restrictions as uh, subcubes of the Hamming cube, right? A restriction has been defined as a, as a function from, your, from variables to zero, one star. Okay, but um, it, it, it makes perfect sense if we have uh, a KDNF, F, or any Boolean function, in fact. You could talk about the complexity of F restricted to an affine subspace of the, of the hypercube, right? Um, okay, so just to remind you, what is an affine sub, subset of the hypercube? Well, it's, you have a linear subspace of the hypercube and you have a translation of that. So that's what, a, that's what affine subspace is. So in particular, every, uh, every subcube of the Hamming cube is an affine subspace, okay? But n not, not, not vice versa. So, the, so we're going to be looking at a more general notion of what, what a restriction is. And, um, and at the end, I'll show why this is, why this is a, a useful. Okay, and just uh, to, to, to summarize, I'll define this more formally, but just the, what we're building to is this affine switching lemma, which says, so I'm going to define what does it mean for a arbitrary random um, distribution of affine subspaces 
to be p-bounded, okay? And for, for a KDNF, or, or in fact a K-clip decision tree, in a p-bounded affine uh, subset, we get the same bound here by essentially the same proof. Okay, so now let me, let me define a bit more formally what this means. Okay? So first of all, let me, let's just uh, um, consider more carefully what does it mean to apply an affine restriction to a Boolean function or to a, or to a decision tree. Okay? Remember, restrictions, we're viewing them as a kind of syntactic uh, uh, operation on decision trees. So I want to be, be a little bit careful and define this also with respect to an affine, uh, affine set. So first of all, if we have a Boolean, invariable Boolean function, then you know, this f restricted on A means the thing, it, you know, <laughs> the thing it usually means in mathematics. You just restrict the domain of f to, to A. And when I say the decision tree depth of a function f on an affine set, well then it just means the minimum depth of a decision tree which computes f correctly on all points of A. This is a very, very natural uh, uh, notation, right? Okay, so let's see, what, is, what does it mean now to um, hit a decision tree with, uh, with an affine uh, restriction? Okay, and so the formal definition is, is, uh, is I guess, uh, inductive, but let me just show it, I'll just illustrate it in the same way I did before. So here's an example of an affine restriction, which is essentially setting one bit of information, okay? Um, so this is, this is an example of an affine set, which is not, not, a, you know, not a subcube. We look at the set of, of x, where coordinate x1, x1 is different from x3, okay? So what would it mean to hit this, this decision tree with this restriction? So the definition is inductive, but you know, the first the first time we read x3, it's kind of a free variable um, because it could be, in, in the set A, it could occur either as a 0 or a 1. And in fact, for a random element here, it would occur with equal probability as a 0 or a 1. Um, so, okay, so we would kind of continue, but now with respect to the affine space where we set x3 to 1 or we set x3 to 0. Now, in, this has the consequence of setting x1 to 1 in this, in this subtree, and x1 gets set to 1. Uh, oh, did I have this? I guess I have this wrong. So this, I guess here it should be, uh, this one should be 0. Okay. Okay, so uh, I, didn't, I didn't define this completely formally, but I hope that this is, uh, it's clear how, how this would work. Okay, um, this, here I'm repeating a previous slide. Just show, um, uh, so remember, remember how we define this random restriction rho uh, SU, right? So S we had an arbitrary distribution of stars, U was a random, uh, a random element of the hypercube, and we, we had uh, this random restriction. Now I'm going to generalize this to, to, uh, to uh, affine restrictions. So now, playing the role of S, we're going to introduce a random variable V. And V is going to be a, just any distribution on linear subspaces of the hypercube. And we're really going to think of, think of V as, in some sense, playing the role of the stars. And we're still going to have this U. U is going to be playing the role of the assignment off, off of the stars. And it, it, so it's the same. And now, instead of this random restriction like this, we just consider the random affine space v plus u, so, okay, and, and as before, v and u are going to be independent. So we have any distribution we want on linear subspaces, but then once you sample from that, we're taking a ran uh, sort of a uniform random translation of, of that space, okay, and that, that corresponds to, you know, being unbiased with respect to the assignments once you fix the stars. So really think of these as, as an analog. Okay, here, so I'm just saying the same thing here. This is, V is the arrangement of stars in some sense. U is the assignment to non-stars. Okay, and next I want to point out that this, this affine space really d is, a, is a direct generalization of this random subcube restriction. Okay, uh, here's how you can see that. Um, le let B1 to Bn be the standard basis for, the, for this linear space, right? So it's the coordinate function Bi, the, the ith coordinate is 1, and everything else is 0. 
So now if I, if I do have a distribution S of stars, I can, I can look at the corresponding distribution on, on, on um, linear subspaces, which is just you sample your S and then you take the span of the BIs for I and S. So this is, a su this is a, in fact a subcube where all the fixed variables are zero. All right? Um, and the claim is that then V plus U is just this, is exactly the same as the subcube defined by this rho sub SU. So we're really taking a generalization of this, you know, this V plus U is just a generalization of rho SU. Okay, and what I want to point out is that the, yeah, so our switching lemma for rho SU is also going to generalize to, to this distribution on affine spaces. So I need to tell you, however, what does it mean, what's the corresponding notion of being p-bounded for a distribution of linear subset. Okay, so here just recalling the definition of a random set of variables being p-bounded, right, it means that for every set j of, of variables the probability that j is contained in S is at most p to the size of j. Okay, so I want to, we want to define the analogous notion now for a distribution on linear subspaces. Okay, so. Uh, mm -hmm. so if the V is uniform distributed over all possible linear subspaces, or you take some set of linear subspaces and then you take the uniform. It, so it doesn't have to, it can be an arbitrary distribution on linear subspaces. It, it not necessarily, it could, be, it could be uniform over some set of linear subspaces, but it's in general, it can be. In fact, in our, in our application it will be, but it... Oh. Okay, so I'll say what shatters means in a second, but let me just... Uh, so, this de definition will look similar, so uh, we'll say that V is p-bounded if for every set J of variables, the probability that V shatters J is bounded by P to the size of J. So V shatters J will be the kind of... Uh, anal uh, you know, will be analogous to S containing J. So what... So if you, this is this, this notion of shatters may be familiar from definition of VC dimension. What does it mean to, so more, okay, what does this actually mean? It means that for every subset of J, for every subset I of J, there's some, some um, element of V which is one on all coordinates of I and zero on all coordinates J of, the, of J minus I. Okay, this is what this means. And so intuitively this is saying that, that you know, all of, the all of the variables in J are, f are, are f collectively free in some sense with respect to this, the, you know, the, the stars of V. Uh, a different perspective on this, which is, which is actually maybe more, more useful or accurate, is really what we're talking about here is we're, we're saying that the set J is independent in the matroid associated with this this uh, linear sub this uh, linear set. Okay, I won't define what 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 that means. So I avoid using the word independent here because I don't want to confuse with uh, independence in this vector space. So this is a, a different notion. Okay, so the every linear subspace of zero one to the n induces a so-called binary matroid on on uh, on on the set one to n. Okay, so just, uh, just but anyway, so this, this, this is a equivalent. Okay. And, and moreover, yeah, so um, in, the, in the case where V corresponded to A, I want, th these definitions are equivalent to each other. If we, so if we're generating V by S, so if, if in the previous case where V is just the span of the basis elements corresponding to a random S, then J would be contained in S if and only if V shatters J. So, so again, this is just generalizing the definition. Okay, and now, um, uh, so now let's fix any p-bounded uh, distribution of linear subspaces V, and and we have an independent U, and A will be just the the random translation of V, right? V V plus U. So A is our distribute. A, A is now like the row S U. Okay, um, and then, so the theorem is that for every k-clip decision tree T, 
we get this similar looking bound as we had before if, you know, if V is uh, P bounded. And the proof is, uh, is, is actually really almost uh, identical to the previous switching lemma. Um, I'll, I'll say something in a second, but just, uh, yeah, so the corollary is that, you know, for every K DNF F, we get, we get the same bounds um, on the decision tree depth of F restricted on A. Okay, and so here's the main conjecture, uh, so open, you know, very interesting open question I wanted to raise. Uh, you know, can we improve this to PK to the L? So I conjecture that, so here I, I, I think we can't improve it because we're talking about K-clip decision trees. But, you know, but here I don't see, you know, I, I strongly believe that this conjecture should be the case. And as I'll mention later, if, we, if you could prove this conjecture, it wouldn't formally strengthen our uh, AC0 Frege lower bound, but it would, it, would, it, would, um, it would seem to take you almost all the way there. Yep? Distribution other than oh yes, I'll discuss. Yes, I'll discuss one uh, in a second. Yeah. So of course, I mean this isn't just a, a yeah an exercise in trying to generalize definitions. So we we um, have a very particular distribution on affine subspaces where we apply this, which is you know, and I'll show that uh, in a, in a minute. Can I have a better bound for the like, decision freeze? What's that? Can I have a better bound for parity decision freeze here? So it's, um, uh, well, I mean, parity decision tree is a generalization of decision tree, so it would be, wouldn't be a better bound. But, yeah, and, and it's yeah. very important, this, this is not giving anything for parity decision trees. Okay. So that's, a, that's probably important to note. So we're, you're still querying individual variables. Otherwise, the definition of p-bounded would, wouldn't make sense. I mean, it's, it's very important that, you know, 0, 1 to the n you know, is we view it as a, as a, not just as a vector space, but a vector space with the basis B1 to Bn, because then you're allowed to query B1 to Bn, it's, yeah. Okay, so, can sure. Can you just remind me where this 2 to the K show up in the argument? Where was it? Uh, it, it? It shows up um, in this moment bound for the uh, expectation of the, uh, you know, el el elf power of a random, uh, but basically, it's it's it seems to be inherent to this, you know. Okay, um, so just to say briefly, there's also like this equivalence lemma at play. So the proof is going to be exactly really the same as the as the one for row SU. Um, but now we we have the following kind of equivalence lemma, okay? And this is kind of using. Uh, I'll just. I'll just state it, I won't dwell on it. I mean, maybe it's, it should be uh, fairly intuitive if you've seen maybe this notion of ma matroids before, but... Um, so we can state it, in fact, it's, it's easier to, to see for any fixed... We can just completely fix V, and we're only looking at a random U. And then we have the following equivalence between distributions. You hit T with... You know, look at T on a uniform random translation of V, and take a random walk down that decision tree. Um, or you can take a, a random walk down T, okay, and then you take the, the greedy basis of, of these variables in the V matroid. Okay, it's, what it is, it's the lexicographically kind of minimal set, you know, you take the, you know, set of variables such that, you know, V shatters this single variable, then V shatters this set of two variables, and you do that in a kind of greedy way. So this is a, I'm not claiming this is direct to C or anything, it takes a kind of inductive argument, but it's, it's really a generalization of what's happening in the, in the, in the previous case of rho SU. Okay, so, and now, oh, one small final generalization of this, which we're gonna need. So here, I've just for, some, for the sake of simplicity and first presenting this definition, I've been talking about, you know, V is a, a random linear subspace of 0, 1 to the n and use a random element of 0, 1 to the n. But in order to apply this switching lemma inductively, we're going to, we're not, we're, we're going to go from one affine subspace to a smaller random sub, subspace of that to a random subspace of that. So we're not in general working with subcubes at all. So 
the final generalization is this ambient space 0, 1 to the n, you could actually make it any, an arbitrary fixed affine subspace B of 0, 1 to the n. Okay, so put B here. And now, now A will always be a random affine subspace of B. So V will be, will be supported on linear subspaces of B, but then we take a, a uniform random translation of A within B. Okay, this is just the... Uh, and here everything, we have the same theorem as before, and the only extra hypothesis we need to say is that our decision tree, we have a K-clip decision tree, which is so-called B independent, and all I mean is that for every branch beta of T is shattered by B. In the previous case where B was just the, the hypercube, this, this actually just means that no variable is queried twice along a branch. Okay? Um, so here, uh, yeah, so this is, the, this is the analogous notion of that for, for, for B. In your previous example, when you were specifying the XOR of X1 and X3, once you asked about X1, you wouldn't be allowed to ask about X3. So yes, exactly, right, right. So that original, so, so yeah, so very good. So then that original um, decision tree uh, would not be, would not be um, A independent with respect to that A. And one observation is that if I have a B independent decision tree T, after I hit it with any, any A here, what you get is, is an A independent decision tree. That's also a consequence of the definition. Okay. Okay, good. So, um, okay, so th that's, the, that's the general ver form of, the, of this, dis this uh, switching lemma for affine restrictions. Now, you know, we, we, we defined all this. Okay, so I should say this. Uh, this comes from a paper, a uh, recent joint work with Tony Patassi, Rocco Cervedio, Liang Tan. Um, and we use it to prove uh, a result in proof complexity. Okay, so it's going to be, you know, we're, we're going to be looking at this, you know, particular distribution on affine subspaces. But let me just tell you what the, what the application is and... Uh, okay, so the, what we're able to show using this new affine switching lemma um, is the following bound on the, the depth D AC0 Frege complexity of the Seiten tautology on a three regular expander graph. Okay? And we are able to prove this lower bound which, similar to what you get for parity by using this, this, this weak switching lemma. Uh, we get a lower bound of the form exponential in log n over d squared. Okay? So again, it's super polynomial up to depth square root log n. And just to compare it to what was known previously, so previ the previous work, well, there, were, there was this trade-off, this, this uh, um, lower bound of exponential and n to the 1 over 2 to the d. This is for pigeonhole principle originally in this, this paper of uh, Beam, Patassi, and Pagliazzo. Um, and it was extended by Eli Ben Sasson to um, this uh, Seiten tautology is via a reduction, a very clever reduction to the pigeonhole principle. So, um, but the point is that this lower bound, you know, for, um, in, the, in the case of parity, right, circuit, AC0 circuits for parity, we had exponential and n to the 1 over d. So this is much worse in terms of the d. It's exponential and n to the 1 over 2 to the d. So in particular, this is only super polynomial up to depth log log n. However, for any fixed depth d, this is exponential. Whereas our lower bound is, you know, only quasi-polynomial for, well, for any d, but it extends to a higher depth, to depth square root log n. And, uh, and, you know, right, if you could improve this affine switching lemma, then I'm confident that you could get uh, the, 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 oh, well, that should be D. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm confident you could get the, the true trade-off. Okay? Um, and let me also say, so, there, this, this is, um, lower bound is not using actually exactly the, the affine switching limit I presented there. Because in the proof complexity co context, you know, we are dealing with a set, uh, an unsatisfiable system of linear equations. So there's actually no underlying affine set. Okay, so then there's a lot of gymnastics involved in, you're always sort of working modulo, you know, uh, affine spaces which have, you know, a push the contradiction, you know, 
somewhere. So there, there is a whole other level to the, you know, a whole other layer of uh, generalization involved in getting the proof complexity context. But the fundamental mechanics of the switching lemma are what I presented here. Is that a formal implication that improving the affine switching lemma will get a better? No. So you'd still, if you improve the affine switching lemma, then you'd still need to do these gymnastics. You still need to argue about these gymnastics uh, somehow. But it should be, it should be the same. But I just don't want to claim it's a formal. Okay. Now I, I will tell you, I'll tell you on the board uh, briefly what what the what the distributions are that we consider. But yeah, just to just to mention what's the open the open problem again. Um, so, so this was our affine switching lemma for KDNFs. And the proof of it was by you analyze, you first build a canonical decision tree of F, then hit it with A. And the conjecture is that if you do things in the standard way, you know, you first hit F with A and then look at the canonical decision tree. It would be great if you could prove the better lower bound, I mean the better, the better bound on the uh, switching lemma that's, that gives similar to the uh, Hastad switching lemma. However, the proof I showed at the, at the end of the first part of the talk with the, you know, arguing about the weight increase and this kind of thing, it, it seems like that proof doesn't seem to generalize in, in any easy way to this setting. So maybe it takes a new idea, but I do believe that this, you know, I, I mean I am stating this as a conjecture. Okay, so finally, let me, uh, let me say something briefly about what, what, is the, what, what is this distribution of the p-bounded random linear subspaces that, that, that we actually use. And I won't say much about this because uh, Tony is giving a talk uh, on this result uh, in two days. So I guess you'll, you'll hear more about it. But um, uh, so basically... Um, so we have a graph which is a three regular expander. I'm going to start by saying what's the ambient space B. So it's, you know, we, we, don't, we don't start with 0, 1 to the n. We start with a kind of um, even Seiten tautology, or not tautology, but, uh, okay. So a three regular expander locally just looks like a, like a three regular tree. And our, for every edge in this tree, we're going to have variables x, e. Okay, so the, the, the variables are the edges in this graph. And we're going to look at the linear, so B will be the linear subspace of all assignments X, where um, if I look at any, if I look at the three edges, well, if this is edge E1, E2, E3. So for every three edges around a common vertex, we say that the, um, the sum of the constraints is zero mod two. Okay. You know, for all for all vertices V. Okay. So this is a this is a linear subspace and it's defining this, you know, uh, think of this similar to the site and tautology, except this is satisfiable. I mean this is this is uh, you know, we're saying that uh, you know, all the constraints are even. In the Seiten tautology, you have all but one of the, you know, for, for one particular vertex, we'd say that the sum of these things is odd, and then we have something which is unsatisfiable. But for the purpose of explaining the switching lemma, we're starting off with this B. Now, the, the distribution we take, I'm going to define now um, a distribution V of linear, linear subspaces of B. And it's going to be p-bounded, and this is, this is what we use in our switching lemma. And just to tell you very, very briefly how it is, so, okay, let's, so here's the original graph G. And the way we get this linear subspace V is in the following way. So it's, we're going to use, um, we're going to consider, let H be some small, so let's say G has N vertices, and we're going to take a, three regular expander H on a smaller set of vertices. Okay, maybe something like N over log, log N squared, say. And now we use a, uh, a, a certain random embedding of H, a random topological embedding of H in G. From, this comes from a paper of uh, uh, Kleinberg and Rubenfeld. So they show that every uh, sufficiently large expander so every expander graph has um, 
as a topological minor, uh, every small, small enough three regular graph. So basically how this works is we pick this many vertices uniformly at random in the graph, and then we kind of connect them up via long, long paths, sort of like, which are kind of constructed from random walks of length, roughly log n. So we have some topological embedding of the graph H and G. And then we look at the, and then um, our V will be the corresponding, um, the corresponding, you know, even Cyton instance with respect to this, this uh, subgraph here. Okay, so, the, um, and you can, sh you can argue by kind of uh, graph theoretic arguments that this is p-bounded because the point is that if I fix, you fix any small set j of, of indices and the point is that because these guys are connected by paths which are obtained from random walks of length log n and random walks are, you know, rapidly mixing in, a, in an expander so you, you, for any small set of edges here, the probability that they all happen to lie on these long paths um, is, is going to be al almost independent. Now, you could, you, if you had edges which are close together, then they could lie on, the, on a long path. I mean, then there'll, there'll be correlations, but they have to lie on separate long paths in order to, in order to um, be independent in the, in the corresponding matroid. So, just, just to give some intuition for how we actually use this affine uh, switching lemma. Okay, so that's, that's all. Can you repeat the reference for this embedded? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so this is uh, Kleinberg, Rubenfeld. What? Rocco, do you know the year? 96, I okay. think. 96? Yeah. But you don't use this as a black <coughs> so You actually have to... Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. We don't, yeah, exactly, yeah. So really, what, what, so what, I mean, the result here is showing that you know, for every, for every you know, small graph you have, it, it is a minor of this graph, and they use this random process to construct the minor. And we actually, you know, we, we open that up. Yeah. So, okay, so that's kind of a preview. And so, yeah, so there'll be many, you know, so um, switching lemmas and restrictions and random restrictions will feature in many of the talks in the workshop. So just to highlight a few, uh, few coming attractions, so Tony will talk about this expander switching lemma, and in particular how the, I mean, the, the additional gymnastics you need to get the proof to wor work in this uh, uh, AC0 Frege setting. Um, there'll be talks by, by Johan and Avishai, which are giving correlation bounds from improved switching lemmas, and uh, I think Johan and Rocco will be talking about uh, yet, yet another generalization of uh, or another class of random restrictions which come from projections and this depth hierarchy theorem which I didn't touch in this talk um, and Srikanth I guess will tell us uh, about adaptive random restrictions uh, giving lower bounds for AC0 with few fresh threshold gates and I'm sure there's some others as well so yeah thank you very much Maybe time for a few quick questions. Yeah. Okay, if Alektomish has this paper in which he uses this uh, sort of a fine uh, restriction and a sort of a fine switch lemma to prove lower bounds for uh, random switching F and I guess random trick sort for uh, rest K. I don't uh -huh. know if you know what rest K is. This gave a solution, but you can have uh, like a uh, uh, bounded uh, conjunction of K with them. So I was wondering if uh, you are looking to maybe improve that lower bound you think there might Yes, be. Uh, so actually I admit I'm not familiar with, uh, with the paper. I've been, yeah, I mean, I've been me meaning to read some of his papers that are related to this, in particular connections to random K, X, or SAT. And, uh, um, I, I, should also, I should also admit to uh, ignorance of, I mean, it, it could well be that, that some of these ideas um, or different ways of looking at this decision tree switching lemma have come up uh, before and other works that I'm not aware of. Uh, so yeah, and if you do know of uh, such things, please let me know about it. And I should also mention, I'll put the slides uh, on the workshop webpage, I think, if anyone wants to have a look. Basically, I mean, one technical point is that you have to apply the restriction on the canonical decision tree. I mean, you have the tree and then you apply the restriction to the tree and not to the function somehow. 
Uh, is this because you need somehow to have the soundness of the rules in the derivation or something like that? I don't think it's related to that. I think it's just in order to get the, in order to get a bound in the switching lemma. Um, I think, don't they, don't you do in the SEM? Don't you do something very similar in the paper with Sagerlin and in Pagliazzo that you have this decision tree and you have to somehow analyze how the decision works in this decision tree? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been a while, but yeah, okay. be, I'm not sure how, how it relates to what you're doing. Yeah. But, you know. I mean, you're, of course, Hostetz proof also uses the canonical decision tree just as the after. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing is there's many possible canonical decision trees because you could take the clauses in different orders. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, that might bring you back to the Hostetz setting. Yeah, there's a lot of flexibility in yeah. Yeah. Just to kind of comment on that, um, so that the big difference between these restrictions and like the restrictions from like the SPI stuff and from elective just stuff is that in the uh, in those restrictions you actually set like a, a very, very small fraction yeah, yeah, of variables. Yeah. Like a, no, that, of course, yeah, it's like a, a small huge difference. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still like yeah. small switching. Yeah. It's like a number of variables. Yeah, it's like inverse, like common on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Small question with the data to the definition of p bounded. Mm -hmm. For example, like here, <coughs> if instead of using the same p for all variables, I will to use pi for each variable. If I want to say it's p bounded, then I the best thing I can do is take the max of the pi. Oh, yeah, okay. So if you're if you're random s is coordinate wise independent with different p's, then then indeed the uh, you you know you'd be p bounded only for the for the uh, largest of the p's. There's no, like, do you think there's a chance to instead getting something like uh, uh, like product of the pi's to like one over n or something instead, which can be much better? So there's a lot of slow. Okay, so. Um, there is some slack in this. For instance, if you're only looking at decision trees of a given depth, which in fact in the proof complexity setting we are, then you don't actually need, you only need to be p-bounded for sets up to that size. That's one observation. So I, I expect there are ways that you could, uh, and probably if you're there only like a small fraction of points which are bad, then you could argue something that most likely those aren't appearing in the as stars. And, I'm sure that there's a lot of things one could do. Okay, let's start again.